This is Product Management, the podcast powered by Alpha. Welcome. We feature the brightest minds across the numerous disciplines that fuel modern product teams. Join over 15,000 weekly listeners to learn from product leaders, authors, and founders from companies such as Adobe, Shopify, Viacom, Under Armour, and many more. They'll share their insights and best practices for experimentation, user research, leadership, corporate innovation, and more. To receive updates on the latest episodes of this show, subscribe to our weekly newsletter at thisisproductmanagement.com. To learn more about Alpha, the platform that has powered thousands of product experiments for the world's leading brands, visit alphahq.com. Hey, I'm your host, Mike Fishbein. Welcome back. On this episode, I'll be speaking with Mark Rubner, VP of Product Management and Marketing at Blackboard. He'll share the lessons he's learned building new businesses within established companies, including how to segment your market, conduct user research, and position your product to inspire action. My name is Mark Rubner, and I'm the Vice President of Product Management and Marketing for Blackboard's K-12 community engagement line of business. My career in product management started about 25 years ago, formerly at American Express, where I was the first uh, product manager for something other than the card acceptance business. It was the first uh, foray into product on the merchant side of the American Express business, which was really a fascinating time to be. And interestingly, the person who led that division and was really responsible for building that business just was named the new CEO of American Express. Now that Ken Chenault has retired, so it's really exciting to see uh, Steve Squarey rise to the top of that global Fortune 100 company after really making his mark as a product guy. So really exciting stuff for me personally, and uh, a shout out to Steve if he's listening. Congratulations on that. Well, I was at American Express for about 13 years in a variety of different product management Uh, marketing, business development positions, all on a global basis. Again, great training ground for me as a global thinker, uh, a global leader, could not have asked for a better environment to be in. And uh, left in 2007 and began my career in education technology and have been in ed tech largely uh, since then, working both in the K-12 space and the higher education space, uh, bringing products to those markets. Research and development is product management. Mark has 25 years of experience in new product development, including more than a decade at American Express prior to Blackboard. I can't wait to hear what he's learned along the way, but first I asked him to discuss how he got into product management and the businesses he's built along the way. My career has been marked with, I think, a couple of really lucky, serendipitous, right place, right time type of scenarios. Starting really, even before American Express, I got thrusted really when I was very young into a role as a department head for what was then market research uh, for a trade association in the marketing arena. And we had some upheaval in the leadership of that organization. And we were without the president of the organization for about a year. And the four department heads got to run a global trade association for about a year on our own reporting to the board of directors. The reason I bring this up is because it was really my first foray into developing things from scratch. So I was leading what was supposed to be the marketing research department for this industry trade association, but evolved into sort of a CIO role where I was asked to develop one of the first uh, member and association databases. And it sounds a little bit sort of trite now looking back on the ubiquity of these types of databases, but back then, and I'm talking about 1989, Uh, The association was basically running itself off of uh, spreadsheets, and I was asked to to sort of learn how to code and develop a member database that could be, uh, that was relational, and I did. And I did it purely on my own, self-learned, with the help from one other person in, in the organization, and that was my first sort of exciting experience in bringing something from scratch to an industry, and that sort of lit the fire for looking for more opportunities to do that. Then when I got to American Express, I got there in the market research department, but was working and supporting this 
intrapreneurial organization called uh, Merchant Services, and they were focused on the B2B side of the business. And what they were looking to do is develop product, software product, that was initially designed to simply take all of the cost out of doing business with American Express, paper, fax, mail, printing, very heavy paper-based business at the time, and automate it, take out the paper. And from there, we started developing these software products and these ASP-driven products and all of this business structure around new things we could sell to merchants who accepted the American Express card. And that opened up a whole new world for me as I was doing the market concept testing for those products. Well, they grew so fast that they started to need real product managers, folks who understood how to apply product management discipline to this new group of products. And I was hired as one of the first three to come in and do that. And that was really the start of my career in product management. And along the way, develop products and services that folks use today on a daily basis in credit card and e-commerce world, including the complete automation of all of the back office reporting that American Express handles between itself and the merchants who accept the card, online e-commerce transactions, which today seems ubiquitous, wasn't back in 1996 when we helped develop it, the ability to buy a American Express gift card in a supermarket was developed by my team. The ability to do that in a shopping mall was developed by my team. And these sort of accomplishments sort of dot my career, many of which just happen to be uh, the result of me saying, okay, sure, I'll give it a shot. Or, you know, yeah, I'll do that. Or I'll be the first to try that. And it speaks really to an overall perspective that I, I really can't overstate, which is, hey, if the opportunity presents itself as a product manager, say yes first and then figure out how to do it later. That's really the essence of a lot of what we're gonna talk about today in terms of driving innovation within larger organizations. Say yes first, and then figure out the rest later. And my career has really been dotted with those types of opportunities and achievements. Mark has built several successful businesses from within established companies. I asked him to share the most significant challenges he's faced in this approach. One of the things that product managers within large organizations need to keep in mind, first and foremost, is that large organizations are simply not set up to innovate, period, full stop, end of story. Their DNA has evolved to do exactly the opposite. Large corporations essentially are fortresses. They're big caps, and all of the armaments and investment in castles and fortresses is built on defense built on defending the castle, not in going out and conquering new lands, but in defending the fortress. And thus that sort of mentality is pervasive in large organizations. They don't have the compensation structures. They don't have the, the uh, talent acquisition mindset. They don't have the investment protocols. They don't have the investment assessment mechanisms to drive real true innovation. What some of them do very well is incremental improvement. So they take what they've got today and they invest in the incremental improvements that help them keep their current customers and win their fair share of new business. That is the opposite of what innovative product management needs to do. So doing so in large corporations means breaking away wholly, physically, structurally, organizationally, breaking away from that mindset. And the best a uh, codification of that I've seen recently is in Jeffrey Moore's book called Zone to Win. I think it's his newest. He's obviously famous for crossing the chasm. But Zone to Win is that next iteration of thinking where Moore sort of says, hey, stop thinking large corporations can disrupt themselves. That is the biggest bunch of BS in the entire world. They can't disrupt themselves. They're not built to disrupt themselves. And nobody there wants to disrupt themselves. That's a fallacy. In order to innovate, in a large corporation, you must wholly separate the innovators from the rest of the organization and give them a zone, give them a place to go ahead and do what innovators do. And that is step one. It's the realization that it can't be done within an organization in the current construct, and two, to go ahead and build that construct. Those innovators are judged and evaluated on a wholly separate group of criteria, with a wholly separate type of organization, and a wholly different type of mindset, 
with a wholly different set of goals. That's how you get from point A to point B on the innovation scale in large companies. So rule number one is it absolutely positively has to be wholly separate. Now, it doesn't mean it needs to be a different DBA or a different corporate structure from a legal perspective. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is you have to create an organization that functions outside of the P&L of the larger organization. And it has to be understood that the return from this group, the innovation group, is measured wholly differently than the expectations for the company writ large, right? Wholly separate. That means you have to have a different organizational structure. You have to have different investment and return timelines. In other words, different return on investment timelines. And you have to take the quarterly mentality out of that construct if you're gonna drive innovation. Innovators don't worry about quarterly results. They don't report quarterly sales. They understand that they're in it for the long term, for the three-year return, not the quarter by quarter return. And thus you have to hire, recruit, and staff with folks whose expectations for success are very different. If you're going to take, let's say, a traditional company CFO or ops director and put them in this innovation area or zone, you're gonna fail because their DNA isn't set up for waiting around for two to three years before something hits. You have to bring people in from the outside who've been there and done that, who understand the construct of innovation, the timelines, the expected returns, and the economics of innovation, not maintenance. So those are the key elements that have to be in place very specifically in order for that to thrive. If you hire the same folks to innovate and to run these innovation zones as you do the corporate writ large structure, recipe for failure. Large organizations are not set up to innovate. They're set up to defend, Mark says. That's why he recommends new product development teams physically break away from the parent company, establish new metrics for measuring success, and recruit people who understand those metrics. How does Mark make build-by partner assessments when developing a strategy for growth and innovation? I'll tell it in a story, right? So one of my favorite stories about build-by comes from when I was at American Express and I moved into the traveler's check business. Folks at American Express looked at me like I had six heads. And they said, Mark, why do you want to go work in the travel check business? This is 150 years old, and it's boring, and there's nothing new going on there, and it's dying. Why do you want to go work there? And the reason I was attracted to working there was because they were about to completely and wholly change their business. And they were about to move from a paper-based travelers and gift check-based business to a plastic-based business of traveler's check cards and gift cards. So they were moving from that paper-based traveler's check business to something called the prepaid card business, which again today is everywhere, right? Gee, Mark, that's not really exciting. You know, we've we've had plastic prepaid cards forever. Yeah, you have, because of folks like the teams at American Express who enabled to happen. And so that transformation was incredibly appealing to me. And so I took on the role of build of transform of helping to transform that paper based business to a card based prepaid business and in doing so we had to pick a place to start that transformation and the place we picked of all bizarre places was the shopping mall gift check to gift card transformation business now if you remember like you I think you probably remember this if you we used to go into a shopping mall and you wanted to buy something for your cousin for the holidays right you went in and you couldn't figure out what to buy him So you went to the kiosk in the middle of the mall and you bought a mall gift check. You remember those days when you'd wait online and you'd go ahead and you'd buy them a gift check. You could use it anywhere in the mall. Well, that business was evolving to a card business and American Express wanted a piece of that business. We wanted to be the gift card business in the shopping mall market. And at the time, Visa and Discover had a really big presence. And we went in there and we learning how we could win the business We saw that the process of buying, funding, and authorizing these cards was incredibly painful at the point of purchase. It took forever to get these cards paid for, to get them activated, to get them authorized. It was just a nightmare. And the lines were queuing up around the mall because the clerks couldn't get it done in time. So we saw an opportunity to innovate and bring product that we could sell to shopping malls that could help them get these three things done much more efficiently. 
So it was my team's job to go out and build this process. And in order to build it, we had to do it in a matter in a really short amount of time in order to be ready for that year's holiday season. So we had to conceive it, we had to win the business, and we had to deliver it all within about a four month time frame. And then, by the way, the first use of it would be during the busiest season of the entire year. So all the challenges were ripe for us to either have a wild success story or a dismal failure initiative. And what we did was we looked at what our current assets were, and we had to make the classic build by partner decision. And we had to set up the criteria for making that decision. Speed was obviously one of them. So the first thing in dealing with a build by partner decision is what's more important, speed, cost, or goodness of fit, or scope as you'd call it. What do you need to get done? Well, we couldn't move the clock, we couldn't move the calendar, so speed was critical. And we knew if we had any chance at all of making that holiday season, that initial holiday season, we'd have to go out and use a piece that was already built. And we went all the way to Brighton, England, believe it or not, to go find this piece. And we partnered with a company that already had the prepaid card piece of it built because American Express was never in that business. We didn't have that business. We partnered with a company in Brighton, England to manage that process. And that was the beginning of the innovation cycle. Working with that as the foundation, we were then able to build all the other processes around it because that we were able to sort of acquire that instantly. Long story short, we got all the pieces in place for that initial season. And on Black Friday, we started processing these cards. And we went from, in any given year, American Express sold about a million gift cards through its website. We at peak, we're doing over 1.3, I remember the cycle just like, over 1.3 million cards a day in that very first holiday season without nary a hiccup, except for one really interesting thing. We are operating at such a volume that we needed to go ahead and enable an entirely new Sun Solaris server to process all of the volume so that we wouldn't crash. Because the volume, it just exceeded what we thought we'd need to do. And in that entire process, because we were able to partner with this company, we're able to get a second server up and running within 24 hours. And it was just the sort of the, the culmination of the right decision given the right weights of the right variables at the right time. And that's sort of a classic build by partner decisioning process. You have to decide based on the most important criteria, speed, cost, goodness of fit. That story sort of is a good example, I think, of knowing what was important, being able to find it and executing against it. Mark considers three key criteria when making build by partner assessments, speed, cost, and fit. Know what's most important to you and execute against it, he says. I asked Mark how he conducts user research to identify opportunities and adapt to global markets. I think the background of market research is a little bit plays into this little bit. And one of the elements that got into my DNA because of that background and the formality of the schooling and the experience in it is it taught me to look at segments. It taught me not to look at big amorphous globs of markets in the very macro sense. It taught me to look more at markets as segments. And the guiding principle that came out of that sort of market research DNA is the more highly focused, the better. You can't be all things to all people. Your product is not meant to solve every problem for every person. And that market research background helps me keep that in focus. Because what you learn when you go out and you research a market is exactly that, is who's in, who's out, who's a target, who's not, who's going to benefit, and who's not. And if you understand that well through your research, you're going to do a better job from a product perspective because you're going to focus on creating the type of solutions that solve problems for the people who are willing to pay for them and are more likely to have the problem that needs to be solved. And so with that in mind, my teams typically don't go out and do research on big, hairy things, right? We don't go with these big blanket studies and try to find holes and fill them, right? It's more about listening posts. And the concept of listening posts is incredibly important in the research aspect of it. You have to establish market-based listening posts that feed back to you those gaps 
in the market's ability to succeed. So where are the holes in the market today? And how do you find out where they are? Well, you have to talk to as many different listening posts and then engage as many listening posts as possible. And in a corporate environment, what is it? It's salespeople, it's support people, it's customers themselves, it's industry leaders, it's reading the industry material, right? It's understanding the funding, it's understanding the compliance structure of an industry, understanding the legislative environment of an industry. It's talking uh, to competitors and observing what's going on from a competitive perspective. Although, full disclosure, I'm not a big fan of obsessing over competitors. It's a whole other topic of conversation. But those listening posts are what drive the uncovering of that market problem that you can use to help create solutions that people are going to want to buy. So with that in mind, you start to be able to drill down on those segments that are willing to pay for some solution to their problem. And that's the essence and the most important deliverable from the research you do in the market. And I know you and I, as we uh, sort of uh, prepare for this call, I gave an example of my experience in Tokyo one year. It's a good example of it, right? So we were going gangbusters with a product that helped big banks sell traveler's checks and prepaid travel cards in an automated fashion as opposed to the really intense paper and mail based process it used to be. And even to this day, in some banks, if you go and buy a traveler's check, it's a really crappy process. So we went out to try to automate that process. And remember the whole value proposition of a traveler's check back in the day was if it gets lost, we'll replace it. That's the whole value proposition. That's why it exists. So in order to do that, American Express had to have a record of that traveler's check being sold so that it could meet the promise and provide the value if, in fact, you lost your traveler's check. And that was a really crappy process. We developed this product that we sold to banks that helped them do it better. And we were killing it, except in one market in the entire world, and that was in Tokyo, Japan. We couldn't convince a single bank to adopt this solution. We couldn't give it away for free, let alone sell it. And for the life of us, we couldn't figure out what was going on. So I got tired of talking about it and I got myself on an airplane and I flew to Tokyo because I just had to understand why we were having so much difficulty selling this into that market. And what I did was I went with the local rep and I went on a tour of about a half a dozen banks in Tokyo and I watched and observed how these guys sell traveler's checks. So I took what was what I guess you consider to be an anthropological approach, right? I just watched. I, you know, I didn't rely on a piece of paper think of research or, you know, I I went and I observed. And what I saw was that in this particular market, those bank reps were so well trained on this crappy process that the efficiency of how they did it was mind numbing. There was not a single wasted movement. There was not a single wasted transaction. There was not a single wasted process going from, I want to travel checks to fully completing that process was stunningly efficient. And I packed my bags and I went home and I said, we're not selling anything to these guys because we cannot solve a problem that doesn't exist. So we stopped pretending we could and we stopped trying to sell it in that market and we moved on to something else. And that's the essence of the approach I'm talking about when it comes to segmentation. You cannot solve all problems for all people in product management. Look at segments, not big globs of markets. You can't be all things to all people, Mark says. During a customer visit in Tokyo, he learned the importance of understanding what segments aren't a fit. How does Mark approach product development in the challenging market of ed tech? Ed tech, I think, is a little bit, I'll say the word unique. Doesn't mean there aren't other markets to which this concept applies, but It's a market that is insanely averse to change. And if you think about pedagogy, if you think about classroom structure, take all the technology out of it, K-12 education in the United States pretty much looks exactly the same as it did 50 years ago. Kids come, they go to class, they stand in front of a teacher, teacher does what they're going to do, they've got some homework at night, they take some tests, and they go back to school. That's a gross oversimplification for the teachers who are listening to this, They're going to kill me for oversimplifying it like that. But largely, that's what it is. And so the ed tech space has to function within that construct. 
And so change management is a critical skill set for product managers in the ed tech space. And when I say change management, it's about understanding how to help your clients in ed tech process the change that is going to be enabled by the products they adopt. So when an educator adopts a technology, they're doing so knowing full well that their workflow is going to change. That's good for the most part, but managing that change is a challenge. And if a product manager relies on that client to drive and manage that entire change process, that product manager will fail. Their product will fail. Adoption of the product will fail. Servicing and support of that product will fail. Job number one in being successful in ed tech is to help your clients through the change period that your product is going to enable. And for a, a sort of tutorial on how to do that, I recommend John Cotter's book called Leading Change, C-O-T-T-E-R, John Cotter. It's a very simple, straightforward approach with eight steps. And it sounds sort of, I don't mean to turn this into an academic exercise, but you can't be successful in ed tech product management if you don't understand the principles of change management, because that's what you are causing to happen when you sell technology to educators. And I think it's unique to ed tech because in most industries, change is a little bit more welcome. It's really difficult for education institutions, especially in K-12, to absorb change. Those who succeed help their clients adopt to this change. And before you know it, if you've created this environment where change can prosper, you then have entree and access to selling more of your products and getting more adoption of your products because now you are trusted to help them get through that change. The next product is going to drop. So I've said the word change probably a hundred times in that description, but that's on purpose, right? I want to, I want to really make the point that it's not just about fancy innovation. As a matter of fact, it's just the opposite. It's about subtle innovation that may be incredibly intricate in the background, but simply provides the mechanism for advancement, under a construct of change under which clients need to be led by the hand. It's a couple things. First, let's take the word sales out of it, right? Because I don't mean to turn this into a sales tutorial, right? But what has to happen is someone has to convince that buyer, that user in the education space that the risk of not adopting your product is greater than the risk of change that's going to occur if you adopt the product. And that's really important. Shifting the balance of risk is step number one. Organizations that drive adoption in ed tech have done one thing and one thing really well. They've managed to shift that risk profile from I'm too afraid to do anything because I'm scared of the change to if I don't do something, I'm going to be in trouble. Once that shift happens, then you can start the change management process, and then you're going to have success getting into these ed tech environments. Rule number one, change the risk profile, change the balance. Rule number two, paint a very clear before and after picture that drives the vision for what the world looks like post-adoption compared to the world of today. The before and after picture is the most important vision that needs to be established in the mind of the ed tech user. And the most brilliant example of that, that everyone, every product manager should have in their head comes from the weight loss industry of all places. Every single weight loss program, exercise program, diet program you have ever seen in your life is a classic example of before and after. If you think about that construct, it works every time. It's what drives that industry. Today, you look like this and you feel like this. Tomorrow, you'll look like that and you'll feel like that. And one picture tells a thousand words. Ed tech product managers need to constantly have that image in their head and create that same exact vision with that same exact clarity for users in ed tech. And then they will adopt. Then they will change. Then they will buy because they want so badly, so badly to reach the after state.
Paint a clear before and after picture to convince the buyer that the risk of not adopting your product is greater than the risk of change, Mark says. I asked him what R&D projects need in order to become successful businesses. When you talk about ed tech in particular, I think, but ubiquitous across industries, there are really three things to that wrap up. I think a lot of what we've talked about. So one of the ways I'd summarize the last piece of the conversation is if product managers can think about three things, they'll be ahead of the game and on a path towards success. And those three things are value, capacity, and workflow. Value is really a simple ROI proof point. Will I get the return on my investment? Will I achieve the after vision? Will I get to that place where the world is better tomorrow because I've adopted the solution than it was yesterday before I did? It's the essence of value. Capacity is something that I learned in the ed tech space, but applies more ubiquitously. And specifically, if I can enable my users to do more in less time for less money, I'm going to create a winning relationship and I'm going to have a successful product line. Building capacity, especially in the ed tech business where time is short, money short, results are public, man. Building that capacity for ed tech or education leaders to do more in less time for less money is a winning formula for product managers. Prove that you can build that capacity. And then three, remember, at the end of the day, it's almost always about workflow. The clear ability to deliver a, stink, a distinct before and after experience through a product, through a service, or through support, so that the workflow is simply more efficient today than it was yesterday, is a critical winning axiom for product managers. People don't buy data. If you're a product manager and you're selling data, maybe it's business intelligence, maybe it's analytics, you're not really selling data, bud. You're selling workflow. Can I do today or can I do tomorrow more efficiently than what I did yesterday? And if your fancy business intelligence data analytics allows me to do that, then you've basically sold me on improved workflow. I'm not buying the data. I'm buying the workflow. I'm not buying a pretty picture on a website. I'm buying workflow. Can I get my brand message out more efficiently? I used to have to do these 10 things to get my brand message out. Now, because I've enabled this pretty picture, I can do that in two steps. So almost no matter what you start off with in your value proposition, it has to begin with workflow. Mark has shared his battle test lessons on building new products and businesses from within established companies. Measure results in years, not months, segment the market to better understand your customers, and paint a clear before and after picture to inspire your prospects to take action. Next up is the benchmark. Let's hear how Mark reflects on the next series of questions we ask all interviewees to ask themselves. What's the best way to learn more about R&D and the other topics we've discussed? Well, I mentioned the Jeffrey Moore book. It's a quick read. It's a really eye-opening book, especially if you're working in a large corporation and you know this opportunity to be more entrepreneurial. The second resource there is a book called F-I-R-E, Fire, by Dan Ward. And Dan Ward was a army colonel who was essentially the head of product management for the United States Army. And he was responsible for bringing big weapon systems to market in the United States Army. And he created a concept called F-I-R-E, which stands for fast, inexpensive, restrained, and elegant. And those four principles, he says, and makes an argument for, separates the big, failed, over-budget, overblown projects from the successful ones. Fast, inexpensive, restrained, and elegant. Strongly recommend that book for both product managers and development leaders who are tired of getting bogged down with big budgets, long time frames, and busted expectations. Really good eye opener in that regard. Two good resources to pick up. How do I get out of the office? Aside from the Japan story, there's an interesting one 
when I started the product management gig at American Express and we were developing these products that drove sort of back office processing efficiency, I'll never forget the visit I made to, you ready for this? To Toys R Us headquarters in uh, Wayne, New Jersey. So I trek up from Manhattan up to Wayne, New Jersey, and I go to Toys R Us headquarters. We're meeting with the folks who process all of the customer disputes that Toys R Us has with American Express cardholders who say, look, I bought this toy and it didn't work and I want my money back. Or, you know, you promised me a refund. I never got it. And there's a whole process in place for customers to register that inquiry and for merchants to respond. And that process is actually federally regulated with specific timeframes and processes, blah, blah, blah. And we took all of the paper and mail based experiences out of that and we automated it through technology. I remember being in that, in a room, almost looked like a warehouse. And it must have been 10,000 square feet of filing cabinets, just filing cabinets with three human beings on this uh, eighth or ninth floor of this office building. And in those filing cabinets were the disputes of customers on pieces of paper and the receipts that the three clerks needed to comb through in order to respond to those inquiries. And what happens was, what happened is if you don't respond to the inquiry in the federally mandated time frame, the customer is entitled to a full refund by law. So these guys had to hustle to go find these receipts, mail them back, make photocopies in this horrible, horrible environment of this huge warehouse. I'll never forget sitting in front of that room and looking at this guy in the eye and saying, I can make all of these filing cabinets disappear. And that one line was turned a complete relationship around in the retail sector for how we go went about selling in this product. And I never would have seen that, understood that, or gotten that in my head if I hadn't gotten my butt out of my office and gone up to Wayne, New Jersey to see the environment our clients were working in. Got to get out of the office. Got to see the environment folks are working in. And you got to think like an anthropologist. I cannot stress enough how much of an advantage you will have in product management if you understand the concepts of anthropology. As a matter of fact, we just hired, I just brought a new product manager on board uh, this Monday. She started an anthropology degree. It just put her a mile ahead of other candidates. What am I reading or listening to right now? I really am an avid reader. I read all the time, always reading, but I never read more than one book at a time. So I'm very much a parallel processor in my day-to-day stuff, but I can only read and deal with one book at a time. So right now, I just finished a book called Supermensch by Chef Gordon. And this is a phenomenally hysterical and interesting book. And Chef Gordon is basically a business manager for Alice Cooper and a few other rock stars. He got his early start with folks like Janis Joplin and, and just a really interesting sort of career from this uh, schlubby guy from Brooklyn, went out to California, became this business manager to stars. And his claim to fame is he started the concept of the superstar chef. And his early clients included folks like Emeril Lagasse, Mario Batali, and he turned that industry into a celebrity chef industry. And the way he went about it is a couple of great business lessons. And I took, you know, the stories are entertaining because they're about famous people, but it's really just exciting to see from a business perspective how he went about taking care of his clients, building industry, building concepts, and doing so while taking control of the careers of other people, trust, setting expectations, delivering on them, doing what it takes, all concepts of real strong leadership. Great book to read. And I just finished that and I just picked up a present from my birthday from my one of my sons who works uh, at Barnes & Noble part-time. He just picked up this Hollow Ground which is a Civil War history book by uh, Bruce Catton, C-A-T-T-O-N, and big, big, big uh, Civil War buff. And this is a great narrative on the Civil War. So those are the two, the book I just finished and what I'm reading right this minute. What's a new favorite product I've been using outside of work? So because I've been traveling so much over the past six months, I haven't been able to cook and I love to cook. I used to do most of the cooking in the house, and I've been traveling so much that my wife has taken over the cooking responsibility. So she's cooking now Monday through Thursday, Friday and Saturday. We typically go out. And Sunday, now I can cook, right? I can cook on Sundays because I'm home, and we have a lot of people coming over. We got the the girlfriends of the kids, and we've got the neighbors. And so Sunday's the big meal day. 
So we'll barbecue or we'll do something, but it's always big, right? It's always lots of food. Now that the weather's starting to turn a little bit, we're starting to go back to the soups and the stews and the, the big sort of single pot meals. And I just picked up, you're going to laugh, right? I just picked up a seven quart crock pot and I never, ever had a crock pot. In all the years I've been, never had a crock pot, never had a slow cooker. And this thing is the most brilliant example of elegant sim simplicity. The thing is huge, so it handles enough food to feed an army, which is exactly what I need. And it has one freaking knob. That's it. It has one knob, three settings, high, low, warm, done, end of story. And it produces brilliant consistency every single time. Absolutely bizarre that something as simple as that would turn me on. But Mike, I can't say enough about how brilliant this freaking one button crock pot is. It's phenomenal. Listeners can connect with Mark on LinkedIn. That's our show. Until next time, this is Mike Fishbein from Alpha. If you enjoy the show, I encourage you to go beyond iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud and subscribe on our website, thisisproductmanagement.com. Every Monday, you'll get an email from me with the latest episode, exclusive product management resources, discounts to conferences, and opportunities to ask future guests a question that will be aired on the show. Visit thisisproductmanagement.com to subscribe.